Okay, five, four, three, two, one, and let's go. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Really delighted that you're joining us this afternoon for this Buses Forum. Uh, my name is Linda McCord from Transport Focus. Uh, I'm a senior stakeholder manager for Transport Focus, but I also chair the Bus Alliance in the West Midlands, and I'm very passionate about our buses. So just a few little bits of housekeeping before we get started, just to let you know that we're recording this session. Uh, please mute your microphones to reduce the background noise and then also please do post your comments and questions in the chat throughout so that we can pick those up. So the plan is that I'm just going to give a few minutes uh, overview of my thoughts on buses. Then I'll pass over to Paul O'Neill, who will give a few thoughts as well. And then I've got some specific questions for each of our panel, who I will introduce. And then we will have some time for you to put some questions to us. And as I said, do put those on the chat so we, we, we can keep an eye on those. So at a, at a similar conference, well, not quite similar because we're in a different type of world, a few years ago, one of the speakers said that public transport offers people freedom. And I thought, well, yes, however, it has to be good transport and a good bus service offers people freedom to travel for work, education and leisure. It opens up possibilities, connects people and places. So what does good look like? In transport focus, we know through and said that we carried out that passengers top priorities are more buses on time, Buses running more often and going to more peak places. People also want value for money tickets. And now, as we've seen in the last 15 months or so, safety and cleanliness have become extremely important to people. So very pleased to see that the National Bus Strategy wants these priorities and more delivered. Bus services, services need to be good. And actually, I think bus services need to be great, if not ex excellent, uh, and consistently so, to give people confidence to use them. For passengers to come back onto our buses and also to encourage those who have not used them before to do so. So we're going to hear from our panel on how we build back better buses and better connect people and places. So how are we going to deliver great bus services here in the north? So I'm going to pass over now to Paul O'Neill, who's the Managing Director of Arriva UK Bus. Hi, everyone, and thank you, Linda, for the invitation and, and the introduction. So, yeah, Arriva is, is, is a big player in the north from a, a bus transport perspective. Um, you know, we, we deliver tens of millions of, of bus journeys every year. We employ 5,000 uh, team members and we utilise 1,800 uh, vehicles. So this is a really important uh, conversation for us. And, and I thought it'd be worth stimulating the conversation by just giving you just a couple of minutes overview of what we think about the national bus strategy and, and build back better with bus. And I guess the first thing to say is that we are really, really delighted with the national bus strategy and really committed to it. And, and why is that? Because the key tenant of the national bus strategy really is around driving patronage and, and it's really moving the modal shift from car uh, and, and to, into bus. And, and we think COVID recovery uh, really is best served with, with the bus as opposed, as opposed to the car. And actually, you know, we've got this saying in, in Arriva that, that actually this is a win-win-win-win situation. Uh, and, and what do I mean by that? Well, if you take each of the, what I would consider the key stakeholders, First of all, the, the customer, the passenger. If they are coming back to the bus and droves, then clearly we are doing something right as, as, as an industry. Uh, and, and we're delivering punctuality, we're delivering reliability, we're delivering value for money, and we're delivering safety. So what's not to like about that? You know, if we're bringing buses back, uh, passengers back to bus, then, then we're really supporting the local and the regional governments because clearly they're focused on, on, on communities, they're focused on, on local industry. Uh, and also in the environment and, and the air quality. So bringing people into buses supports all of that. Again, bringing people back to bus really supports central government. You know, the, the green agenda, the active travel agenda is all supported by bus. And then finally, the operators, you know, more people on buses is good for business, but it also sets up good conditions for sustainable investment uh, going forward. So 
you know, I think and we think there is no downside to, to increasing bus passengers. Um, but if we're going to do that, then, you know, we've got a great opportunity to, to drive real change. You know, anti-congestion measures, we know that, that customers really want fast, frequent and reliable services. If we truly put anti-congestion measures in, then, then we can deliver that. You know, we'll, we've just heard about, about value for money, you know, cap flexible and value for money ticketing. We think, you know, as operators is, is really great and really important. Digital enabled journeys and, and green technology. So again, that, that's all quite exciting, isn't it? But, but we're only gonna achieve that if we truly work together. Uh, and, and what do I mean by that? Well. You know, this three billion pound, three billion pound that, that, that's been put aside, you know, we need to use that wisely. We, we, can, we can't squander that. Um, as stakeholders, we firmly believe we need to be pragmatic, practical and collegiate. We really need to truly work as a team. We need to do what we said we were going to do and we need to move at pace. Pace is important because we've got a window of opportunity here. If we squander that by taking too long, we'll lose the initiative and people will continue to use cars. And there are a number of examples across the UK where really good stakeholder working has delivered real results. And so, for example, you know, we are part of the, the Bus Alliance and Mersey side, and, and we've made big, big, big improvements over the years. But it's going to take us working together. And I think if we, if, if we don't work together, if we take polarised positions, we're going to get a suboptimal outcome. So I propose that, that we truly work together to, to leave a legacy as, as, as opposed to missing an opportunity. And that, that'll hand back to you, Linda, to start the conversation. Thank you. Thank, thank you ever so much, Paul. And yes, we've seen around the country how good, strong alliances can deliver improvements for, for people and for passengers. OK, so I'm delighted to now to introduce Dan Jarvis, MP Sheffield City Region Mayor. And I've got a question for you, for you Dan. So if the North is going to connect its people and places, how can we build back and integrate bus services, which are reliable, greener, faster, and smarter, and deliver greater inclusion and choice. So what's the answer? So over to you, Dan, please. Thank you very much, Linda. That's, that's a good big question. I'll do my best to, to answer it. Well, firstly, let me say it's a real pleasure to be with you today. Transport is one of the essential pillars on which I think that we will build a better South Yorkshire. And our buses are greatest potential to make a difference, especially in the short term. They're responsible for over 80% of local public transport journeys in South Yorkshire. This, to coin a phrase, is where the rubber meets the road. That's why we've invested £17 million of South Yorkshire money to keep services running during COVID. And we've lobbied against central government cutting off their own support, at least £16 million so far, too soon. It's why we're working in partnership with bus companies to get passenger numbers back up and why we're investing more in cheap fares for young people. The buses get extraordinary support because they're not just another business operation. I think that they are critical, a critical service for a decent society. They were an essential lifeline for key workers and others during the pandemic, and they are essential to stopping our region being choked by congestion and pollution as we tackle climate change. And that is why I have to say, I was uh, astonished and disappointed to hear very recently that the same companies we've been working with are now planning to hike fares for the widely used travel master tickets by an inflation busting 5% from June the 7th. It's not yet been made public, but I'm mentioning it here today because I very much hope that they will think again. It's beyond frustrating. In fact, it is unacceptable. Price rises just weeks before the final easing of lockdown measures will understandably be seen as an attempt to profit from the fair paying public as they return back to public transport. It will damage efforts to get people back on the buses and hit them in their pockets at a time of great uncertainty. After so much public support, it's not just tone deaf, it calls into question the effort that we've been making to build a constructive partnership with the companies as we work together to reform our bus services. First, and Stagecoach insist on their commitment to an enhanced partnership, but on this form, 
their attitude seems to be, you pay for the infrastructure and we'll put up the fares. All of this, I think, highlights just how flawed and disempowering deregulation has been. So I think that we need a fundamentally better model, one that unlocks the potential that buses have to help transform South Yorkshire and the wider North and reflects the wider benefits they bring. That means a rapid shift to a zero carbon fleet. It means affordable, flexible fares and routes and frequencies that genuinely serve all of our communities. It means buses integrated into, into a coherent regional system with seamless connections across every mode, including active travel. If the Netherlands can do it, why on earth can't we? So that's my ambition and my answer to the question that you asked me, how do we build back better buses? Build a good system and people will use it. It's why in South Yorkshire, we commissioned the Bets Review. It's why we're already investing six million pounds in ATP concession fares for 18 to 21 year olds and another 3.2 million in better bus stops and in our first electric buses. It's why we're bidding for tens of millions more. And most importantly, it's why we're developing a roadmap for wider reform. That reform will include the structure and ownership of our service. At a minimum, we need a fundamentally different partnership with the bus companies, but we're looking at all the options with an open mind, including franchising. Whatever happens, the absolute bottom line is that we need a structure that delivers the control, coherence and efficiency we need to fulfill our ambitions. Of course, ambition needs investment. We will continue to play our part, but we need national government to do the same. I welcome the national bus strategy, but at the moment it's long on aspiration and short on detail. Public funding for buses has been slashed uh, since the Conservatives took power in 2010, and the three billion that's been promised might sound like quite a lot, but in reality, it is a fraction of what is needed to repair the damage that has been done. The, the government's support for electric buses similarly matches Rolls-Royce aspiration, but so far with pound shop means. So if the government is serious about transforming our buses, the test that matters is providing adequate, long-term, reliable funding. And that's my message today. We need to make good on the potential of our buses, but in the end, that will not happen without real change. Thank you, Linda. Thank you very much. An interesting challenge on, on, on the fares and totally agree. If you build a good system, people will use it. So thank you very much. So I'm going to move over now to Pascal Robinson from Campaign for Better Buses. And Pascal, the question to you is, what more can providers do to build back an integrated and efficient service for users? Thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I completely agree with you, Linda, that this is, we need a really great network, not just a good network, especially if we're gonna get cars off the road and after a year of being told uh, getting buses will risk your health. So I of course started this campaign in Greater Manchester. Um, we have nothing near a great network here. Fares have gone up 55% on average uh, in the last 10 years across the UK and in Greater Manchester, we've lost 8 million miles from our network since 2010. Our network isn't working and it's vital for the survival of our communities and for the planet that we have fantastic bus networks. Public control means that we can cross subsidise so that profits from busy routes can be used for socially necessary routes. It means you can have one single ticket Competition law in a deregulated network means you will always have to offer alternative tickets. Dan Jarvis, you could set the fares, as Khan has done so popularly in London. And it means that you could demand higher standards so that you're getting the green buses that London and Nottingham have. Nottingham is famous across Europe for its green buses, for having started that. And as, as London shows, if the bus is affordable, reliable and regular, people get on it by the billions every year. London's bus use has doubled since the 1980s and in Greater Manchester it's fallen by 40%. Similarly, Nottingham and Reading have the second and highest number of journeys per head in the country because their buses are affordable and regular. 
That's in large part due to the fact that they are in public ownership and all the profits are reinvested back into the service. And Edinburgh's popular bus network was also able to reinvest 3 million into the tram network in 2017, again, in public ownership. The bus strategy, unfortunately, encourages partnerships on the face of this, making this the easiest path to getting the access to the three billion funding. And I have spoken with various different council leaders who have interpreted that as the advice. But partnerships won't deliver the step change that we need. They leave the situation broadly the same with bus companies in control of fares, ticketing, routes and timetables to a wider or smaller extent. Greater Manchester and Merseyside have partnerships, as have been mentioned here, and they've done, they have affected improvements, but both have acknowledged that this isn't enough and have started investigations into public control as a result. What bus companies, I think, need to do across the country is to support regions with the process of bringing buses back into public control. Not all bus companies are opposed and some have supported doing reports and polling into how communities see public control and how that would change their, their life. Now is the time to support this wholeheartedly, we think. But more important than operators is of course what politicians do as these are the representatives of our communities. They're who we elect year in, year out. I would love to see Dan Jarvis and Tracy Braben and all regional mayors in the UK issuing the notice to begin the process for public control before the end of June. They can do this additionally to uh, issuing a notice for partnership, but we would like to see that notice for beginning the process for public control started. Our communities don't want to see smaller changes. They love what Burnham has done in Greater Manchester. They're sick of having no control over an expensive and unreliable bus network here in Greater Manchester. And I know from speaking to passengers day in, day out, that we feel the same all across the country. They know that we deserve what London has and has had for 30 years. And we hope that mayors will deliver that for them in the short term and the long term. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much, uh, Pascal. And I think you're right. We, you know, people should expect high standards uh, and people want to see big changes. Thank you. So I'm going to go over next to Stephen Fiddler, um, who's the co-director of local transport for the Department for Transport. And the question to, to you, Stephen, is how will the national bus strategy reverse the spiral of decline on bus service levels and patronage? Thanks, Linda, and, and thank you for the opportunity to, to join this discussion. The, there's so much of, of what's been said already about what users uh, want in terms of outcomes uh, and the, the need for long term funding uh, that, I, that I just wholeheartedly uh, agree with. The, the kind of real thing at the centre of this strategy is about actually getting a, a virtual circle for bus. So it's so my perspective, great question, because I look at that in sort of two or three different levels. You know, at its simplest, if you think about what's happened over the past few years, actually slower buses, taking longer, costing more to operate, become less attractive, you need more buses to run the same the same frequency, uh, and you end up with, with what, I, what I tend to call a circle of decline, where actually fares go up just to keep the same level of operation going, fewer people come, fares go up. What we're trying to do in the strategy is flip that to say we want buses to be attractive, we want them to be modern, we want the fare structure to be one that people can easily understand, we want them to have the information, but importantly, we want them to have priority. We want them to be able to move faster, to get around places so they are a faster and more attractive way of traveling, uh, but also so that lowers the operating costs, so that allows more money, whether it's through the partnership arrangements or indeed through a franchise network, to be put back into services uh, and to getting an improved offer. And we are pretty optimistic that if, if we get this right, actually that absolutely creates that, that, that virtuous circle, but it will, it'll be down to the local authorities and the operators to make that happen. You know, we, we can sort of set some aspirations, we can set some frameworks, we can set some criteria for funding, but it will come down to the local decisions, some of which I, I totally get will be politically challenging and difficult to implement uh, around how do you give the priority to, to the right vehicle at the right place at the right time and balance the needs of all road users in, in, in doing that. But I also think of it on a, on a kind of bigger level of, you know, this isn't just about bus for bus's sake. 
this is about bust as an enabler of growth about as an enabler of prosperity about allowing people to get out about connecting city centers and if you look at some of the data around city centers you know about a third of their visitors come by bus yeah they're spending 50 to 60 pound each on average every time they visit and that's about sort of you know, 20 plus billion pound a year across city centers being invested by bus passengers so there is really something here for me about a virtual circle of investment in bus helping places thrive helping economies thrive and, and there are rural equivalents of that in, in terms of things you might do with demand rapid transit and, and, and other options as well so I, I think this is the heart of the strategy uh, and look forward to discussing that a, a bit more later thank you very much Stephen and I think picking up the point I made earlier about how good public transport gives people freedom uh, your point about enabling for growth and all of that is, is is really important so thank you very much so we're now moving on to Graham Vidler uh, the chief executive of the Confederation of Passenger Transport and the question for you Graham is how can we work in partnership and deliver better bus services more quickly for people and places which rely on our bus services? And how will the national bus strategy help to deliver choice and inclusion? Hi, Linda, thank you. Uh, great to be here. And that's a, a great question to uh, start me off on, really. Because I, I think as we, as we look around the country now, we can see the benefits of partnership working in different parts of the country. You, you and I, Linda, both sit on the board of the West Midlands Bus Alliance, don't we? Which has driven up patronage over the last few years. Paul, Paul mentioned earlier on uh, Liverpool City region and the successful partnership there, where over the years since it started in about 2014, I think we've seen a 15% increase in bus passengers and a remarkable 150% increase in uh, young people using the bus, driven, I, I might say, by uh, measures on fares, which have been agreed and taken forward by the partnership. So it, it, it can work and it does work. Uh, and, and I think what the national bus strategy seeks to do is to make successful partnerships like the West Midlands, like Liverpool, the norm, all, all across the country. Uh, and it really is our joint responsibility to take that opportunity uh, and the three billion of funding which is promised to support the opportunity and make a success of what is really a once in a generation opportunity to deliver great bus services. But as, as Stephen suggested in his comments, nothing at all will happen without action on behalf of operators and local authorities. Change is going to require genuine partnership and genuine commitment with all of us signed up to an agreed local vision for change. Uh, and all of us then going on to deliver our contribution to that change. Now, of course, what, what every partnership needs to deliver will, will vary to meet local needs. Uh, and what's worked in Liverpool, say, might not work exactly the same in Sheffield uh, and is unlikely to work in some ru more rural parts of the North. But every partnership will have a very simple target at its heart, getting more people to use the bus. And that's what's absolutely at the heart of national bus strategy. Initially, I think that means getting people who used to use the bus to do so again, some of those who haven't returned yet. And ultimately it will mean enabling more people to choose buses because they want to use them for more of their journeys. And so fundamentally, the most important thing we can do to enable those positive choices from people is to put in place measures that put buses at the heart of transport networks. Slow and unpredictable journey times are the number one reason that people don't take the bus at the moment. One in four car users, for example, would be willing to give bus a go if bus services were more reliable and they knew that they could rely on how long it would take to get from A to B. So we want to see the bus service improvement plans that will be developed over the next few months and the partnerships which will eventually flow from them having ambitious plans for bus priority at their heart. Plans which are rooted in local circumstances and form part of overall local transport plans so that they're integrated for example with measures to improve active travel and as Stephen was saying in his comments on uh, building a virtuous circle 
there, there really is a, a dual benefit in doing this. Making buses quicker and more reliable will in itself get more people onto the bus. It will also drive down operators' costs. So, for example, before the pandemic in Manchester, it cost Stagecoach about £8 million a year just to deal with the costs of rising congestion. That's £8 million to stand still, £8 million to buy more buses to operate the same service, £8 million which could have been spent on improving services for passengers instead. Now, the industry is committed to reinvesting the proceeds from bus priority measures back into the bus network to provide better services for passengers, producing more buses, going to more places more often, which sounds an awful lot, Linda, like your description at the start of a, of a great bus service, the great bus service that Transport Focus's research shows that passengers uh, think we need. Uh, and that's what I truly believe that we can deliver through building partnerships on the back of the national bus strategy and committing to them all across the country. That's probably enough for me from now, Linda. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Graham. So we've got two further questions to the panel from me, but I just would like to encourage all of our uh, friends who have joined us uh, this afternoon, please do uh, you know, put, put through some questions or things that you would like us to, to have further discussion on. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to go over to Sylvia Barrett, who's the Head of Policy, Research and Projects for, uh, from Campaign for Better Transport. So the question to you is, can the bus become a practical, affordable and an, an attractive alternative to the car? And will the national bus strategy work to build back better buses in the north? Thanks for having me today. Um, in answer to your question, really, to make buses more attractive, there's two main factors that uh, contribute to this. One is affordability, the other one is connectivity. <clears throat> On the affordability side, uh, buses um, can be uh, not, uh, not a cheap option for many people to use, especially if you have a family of four looking to go out uh, for the day and uh, use the bus instead of the car, uh, or if they don't have a car, it cannot make sense that it's cheaper for them to take a taxi uh, than it is to get on the bus uh, for that trip. So there's a lot that uh, can be done and needs to be done in order to make buses more uh, cheaper and more affordable for people um, on everyday incomes, on low incomes. So um, we welcome the uh, measures in the strategy uh, that uh, propose uh, things like contactless ticketing to make it easier, fair caps uh, to improve that affordability. Uh, but one of the biggest uh, barriers on that also is uh, multi uh, multi operator ticketing. So the fact that you need to you buy one ticket, but it's only um, valid on a certain operator, uh, and if uh, bus services, and if there's uh, more than one operator running in your area, you can only use that ticket on one of those and not on others. But um, uh, there are barriers to multi-operator ticketing. The way I understand it, uh, it's issues like uh, competition regulations and uh, commercial, um, obviously, uh, barriers in uh, operators uh, achieving that together with local authorities. Uh, but if we are to uh, offer a, a truly attractive option to people going forward, that uh, is certainly one barrier that we need to overcome uh, working together between operators and authorities and the, and the government. Um, on the connectivity side, uh, we recently did some research for the uh, APPG on left behind neighbourhoods. Um, and we looked at uh, communities which are already deprived, uh, communities like uh, in County Durham, in Northumberland, uh, former mining communities uh, that, that have high levels of uh, disadvantage already, but they also suffer from lack of uh, good connectivity locally. Uh, and that's because of uh, years of decline um, and uh, poor services uh, in local communities. For example, you have many that uh, are not well served in the evenings or in the weekends or infrequent services. And that results really in people really struggling to get to the places they need to go, places of employment or vital services like hospitals, 
um, the worst um, travel time to a hospital by public transport um, and walking was uh, over one and a half hours. Um, and that's a trip that surely by car will take under half an hour. So, so that surely cannot be right. So we need to be really looking, uh, need, need to be looking at how we can plug these gaps, how we can reconnect those communities that are really reliant on public transport as well. So uh, in left behind communities, you have a uh, much lower public, uh, sorry, car ownership, uh, which makes those communities reliant on, uh, on their buses um, and trains, even though they have seen much bigger declines in provision over, over the years. So um, communities uh, also uh, have the appetite to work together with authorities to uh, to find and address those gaps in provision, but we need uh, local authorities to uh, then work together with us with meaningful engagement uh, in order to review the provisions going forward. So uh, we were very pleased that the national bus strategy uh, gives a much bigger role to local authorities, um, combined authorities uh, across the country to play a bigger role in reviewing provisions locally uh, and working with um, with pro uh, with the operators to uh, to deliver uh, what is required in order to uh, provide that coherent network uh, across the areas. Um, but uh, I, I would think that both uh, enhanced partnerships and franchising can work where there is desire to make them work. Um, but uh, there are really three main issues um, with, with that. One is um, the uh, timelines. Uh, local authorities uh, can struggle to make uh, to meet tight deadlines, especially where they have uh, small teams and uh, low uh, ability to, uh, to prepare these competitive submissions very quickly. Uh, the second one is uh, funding. And from conversations with local authorities, uh, I know that um, many are struggling to, uh, to make um, services uh, operate on the basis of competitive funding pots, for example. So where local authorities uh, are small and have limited capacity uh, to put bids together, uh, they continue to miss out um, year in, year out. Uh, and that's, uh, again, so I'm endorsing the message for uh, multi-year settlements and more long-term allocations that will provide greater certainty for local authorities to deliver uh, in, uh, in collaboration with operators uh, for the priorities of their local communities. Uh, but the third really, and the, the, the capacity that, uh, sorry, the challenge that uh, runs across the previous two challenges that I mentioned is a capacity and capability. So uh, there's very different levels of skills and know-how uh, across different types of authorities. Um, and uh, the fact that uh, buses have been deregulated for uh, many decades means that those skills and knowledge uh, at local authorities has been lost over time. And we're very pleased to be working with the Department of Transport to be uh, charting that um, what that capacity and capability gap means in terms of delivering on the ambitions of the national bus strategy locally. Uh, just two things really uh, to bring there is uh, one that um, even uh, bigger teams, uh, so uh, mayor or combined authorities, for example, uh, have uh, significantly bigger teams uh, compared to, say, smaller unitaries and uh, shy authorities. Uh, and that uh, means that those small authorities are then struggling to uh, have the capacity and the ability uh, to work together with operators to make those enhanced partnerships and uh, work uh, and delivering on the uh, bus service improvement plans. Uh, but even where uh, authorities have big teams, uh, they're currently very focused on delivering on operational priorities. Uh, so that means that uh, even bigger teams need to be freed up to, to, to think more strategically, to work uh, strategically with operators in order to deliver those ambitious plans going forward. Um, the other thing I need to uh, mention is that uh, it's fantastic to hear the Metro Mayor's survey speak so enthusiastically uh, about buses and public transport more generally. But in small councils, especially those in rural areas, uh, there is a... Um, less of an appetite and somewhat of a defeatist attitude towards uh, the uh, predominance of the car in their local areas. And uh, many of them feel like, um, if you will, that there's no point that uh, to be boosting local uh, bus services because it's only um, certain 
portions of the community that, that are rel reliant on them. Uh, but really, uh, th that's not the case. We need to be making sure that uh, buses are attractive to uh, to everyone, not only uh, people that uh, don't have other options. So uh, with that, uh, we need to be much bolder um, and looking at, uh, yes, definitely, uh, we need the carrots of better, more affordable public transport provision, but also a few sticks perhaps for, uh, uh, for cars and uh, the uh, car use, perhaps things like parking. Um, there's lots of um, levers that local authorities have um, in their arsenal in order to, to pull and create that rebalancing towards public transport that we need in order to achieve the um, net zero ambitions uh, in central and local government. So um, there's lots more of this that I can be talking about, but I want to close on that appeal to leaders across the north and across the country to grasp that net or to be ambitious on buses uh, and public transport more generally in order to make sure that it is indeed an attractive alternative. Thank, thank, thank you ever so much, Sylvia. Uh, and I think you do raise a good point and I'll come back on some of the points that all of you have made when we have our further discussion. But that transport property is, is, is something that really is something that we need to be very mindful of. So the last question from me is, is to, you, to you, Paul. Uh, so this is uh, Paul and Neil, Managing Director of Arriva UK Bus. And this is in recovery. And as we get back to traveling to work or for leisure, how can we restore passenger confidence and build back better buses? But I would like to also, Paul, take forward uh, something that Dan Jarvis mentioned around fares and ask you the, the, the points that he, he made and the challenge about increasing fares. Because obviously, as we come out of COVID, we want to encourage people back and we've got to work together to do that. So thank you. Paul. Thank you, Linda. Yeah, quite refreshingly, uh, no one has mentioned COVID on this call yet, uh, something that's really impacted us for the last 18 months or so. Um, but yeah, let me bring us back to COVID. And, and, and when we talk about confidence, it's, it's, it's about confidence of our, our passengers wanting to get back onto public transport, bus, train or, or, or metro or whatever. And clearly we fully understand why there was a, a very strong message at the beginning of, of this terrible pandemic as, as to why you know people had to be very very careful as to what, what they were doing how they were doing it and um, fully understand that but unfortunately one of the, the downsides of that is it does make uh, some of our, our prospective passengers and customers really reluctant to use public transport and, and we know we all know and certainly us in the industry know that public transport is absolutely safe and, and what we need to do now is really get on the front foot and be very unequivocal with, with, with society to say that public transport is safe. It's here to you to be used. It's open. You are all very welcome. Please come back. Uh, and, and that's something that, that we are working with ourselves and our uh, trade body uh, through Graham with the CPT and the DFT and government to really drive that home. Now that we are coming towards a uh, full opening of society, we really need to, to, to have a very strong message. And, and I think that that will drive confidence in the uh, in, 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 in bus usage. So that's the first thing. I think as we, as we come back to the national bus strategy and, and we've, we've all talked about, you know, how we can improve the customer experience. You know, there's this thing in the national bus strategy about the bus services improvement plan. So, so it's not just hot air and talk, it's actually sitting down writing down what you're going to do differently and it's very local it's not just generic what are you in this local area going to do differently to drive partnage to drive the customer experience and i think if, if our you know uh, you know um, society and, and, and our customers and passengers see us working together working as a team having a plan delivering the plan delivering the plan quickly that will grow confidence um, because, you know, nothing drives confidence down more than seeing people, uh, you know, not working together and, and fighting. So, so we may have different perspectives, you know, we may have different views, but we need one plan. And if we have one plan and, and we work together collegiately, I think that will really drive, drive confidence. And clearly, you know, Linda, as, as you mentioned, value for money is, is absolutely, when we do our, 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 our polling and, and, and understand yeah, what our customers really want, then obviously punctuality, reliability, and value for money is, is up there. Uh, and, and that's something, you know, I can't speak for my other colleagues in other industry and, and, and other operators, but certainly that's something that, that we're really focused on from a from an perspective. Thank you. 
Okay, Th thank you ever so much, Paul. So I can see some questions coming in and, uh, and one of them in particular is something that I was going to kind of touch on too. And I'm going to put this to you, Stephen Fiddler, first, if, if, if that's okay. And this is around the difference between the combined authority areas and non-combined authority areas in advancing bus improvements. And it's something that Sylvia and, uh, and others touched on is, you know, are the smaller councils where there's maybe less appetite or where maybe bus is not a priority? Uh, how can we, or how can the department in particular through the national bus strategy help some of these areas to really drive through the improvements that the national bus strategy wants? Thanks, Linda. And, and I think, you know, few, few angles on that really for me. I think the, the first is, is picking up on, on, on Sylvia's point around, around the kind of capability, interest kind of capacity angle. Uh, and yes, I'm sure everybody can benefit, but it's much more likely to be the non-combined authority areas who are gonna benefit from the bus centre of excellence that we're setting up. Uh, and we have very deliberately put aside 25 million pounds this year, exactly to help those places that haven't got the in-house capacity straight away uh, to really kind of develop their skills and to develop their thinking and to try and get going and have the resource to engage. Uh, that, that to an extent is a bit of a sticking plaster. I mean, this, this is a moment of opportunity in, in, in our view that, you know, we've talked about COVID and there's been a lot of downsides, but if there is an ever a time you're going to look at bus fundamentally, you're going to look at networks, you're going to look at fares, you're going to see some moments it's got to be this year as you actually look at new demand travel you look at new kind of ways of attracting people back you think about recovery it's this, this next nine 12 month window and so we're trying to sort of help with that capacity in the short term and um, in the medium term i'm absolutely expecting that the bus service improvement plans that come through for those kind of authorities to reflect the kind of resource and the kind of capacity that they need from us uh, to allow them to really have the, the, the proper resource in-house to take bus work forward into the future uh, and to drive. And that will apply to, to combined authorities as much as non-combined authorities. Uh, but I'm hoping that, that the non-combined authorities that have got the issue more will, will bring it through. I think probably the, the other thing I would say is that yeah, often, and it is a bit generic, but often the scale of the challenge will be quite different in a non-combined authority area if it's less urban the type of solutions you might be looking at might be quite different. What you want to do in a town, the levers you pull may be quite different from the levers in the city. Uh, and I think one of the things we are really interested in, again, I've tried to support quite hard on, is what do you do on a sort of suburban fringe or into a rural context? Uh, and what are the offers that make that work? And, and the Rural Mobility Fund at the moment is trying to pilot a whole raft of different possible demand responsive and other solutions. Uh, and I think my take is, you know, we need to think about that in the, in the national bus strategy context. And I really would encourage people locally, locally to do so. Thank you very much. Graham, uh, can, can I come to you on that point as, uh, as well, please? So you represent a lot of bus operators. I mean, are you hearing anything from them about concerns in any particular areas about getting these bus service improvement plans and them working with the local transport authorities? Um, I mean, I, I, I think Linda, like everybody else, my, my members are concerned about the small amount of time that's available to get them done uh, and the lack of capacity on both sides of the debate, to be perfectly honest, because you know, bus companies don't have lots of people sat around waiting to do bus service improvement plans. And as Stephen has just said, and as Sylvia was saying earlier, nor do local authorities. So there, there are concerns about uh, the ability to get them done, but more hearteningly, I hear nothing but positive feedback about the willingness to get the job done. And, and that's both from all of my members who are 100% signed up to the process and also from all, all of the local authorities that they, they speak to and when I speak to their representative bodies. And I think if we can capture that spirit, uh, and as Paul was saying earlier, produce that plan that we can um, hold each other to account on and also start to talk to people locally about this, this is what we're doing, this is where we're going, 
then I think that's 90% of the job done, Linda. So, so, so there are concerns out there. It's going to be hard work. There's a lot to do, but the spirit's there, and I think that's going to get us there. Thank you very much. Pascal, do you think capturing that spirit is, is, is enough? I mean, I, I have to agree with Graham. I'm, I'm certainly seeing that in, in the West Midlands and the strong partnership that we have there, but not only there, there is a real commitment, I think, from people. But do you think passengers are seeing that or will see that as, as we work closer together? I think passengers are very aware that as we've talked about, it, it's you get the bus when it's easy and affordable and reliable. Um, they are really happy to see ambitious change in Greater Manchester. And there is a lot of talk about how great the buses are in London and how awful they are for the rest of the country. Um, and a, a kind of not quite understanding why that is. I mean, I think that and DFT could do lots of things to make it easier for non-CAs to pull together a case. I really agree with the points around uh, there being quite short timelines. And of course, lots of authorities don't have the capacity anymore um, to pull together ambitious plans on buses. However, there could be a reduction of the number of barriers. Currently, the case to pull together a public control case is, is quite lengthy. Um, we could see Greater Manchester seconding team members to other regions all across the country to be helping to make that case. Um, and DFT could be helping to make special dispensations uh, so that authorities don't have to go uh, necessarily for a partnership so that they can think a bit more about what they would like to see for their buses. But I think the wider thing here is is that passengers really want to see ambition and it is possible. So something I'm thinking about as I'm hearing everyone is the fact that Switzerland has a law which says uh, if you have a population in a village size, you need to provide this amount of, of buses, this service provision. If you have a town this size, you must provide this amount of buses and same, etc. And we do not seem to have that expectation here. Um, for me and the, the things I'm hearing from passengers, it's not that they're sitting in traffic, it's increasingly that there aren't buses to get on. And that's what I was talking about when I was talking about the fact that 8 million miles of network have been cut in Greater Manchester. 37% um, of job seekers in Greater Manchester see transport as a barrier to accessing work. We really need to have ambition here. Um, and, and I hope everyone on this call um, will join in, in working towards that. Thank you very much. And I, I would challenge a, a little bit, Pascal, that how awful the buses are in the rest of the country. Uh, you know, I, 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 the more needs to be done. There's absolutely no doubt about that. But there are parts of the UK where actually there are very good bus services. However, it's like the check is in the post. If the post never lost checks, people couldn't use that excuse. I know we don't use checks anymore, but the same thing with buses. Unless people get that confidence that our buses are consistently great right across the country, then passengers will, will feel that way. We've got about 10 minutes left, and there is something that I feel that came out of a lot of what you're talking about, and I'll start with you, uh, Dan Jarvis, if, if that's okay. I think we need to talk a wee bit about congestion, uh, because I, I think this is is a major thing that we're faced with and, and you know as we encourage people to come back onto our buses if they get on a bus that then sits in traffic and doesn't move it'll be the last time they do so they'll think of other ways so I was wondering what you think as uh, as the mayor about congestion yes absolutely look I think buses have got a fundamentally important role to play in terms of easing congestion and ensuring that our public transport system is environmentally sustainable for the for the longer run i just if i may just want to make a sort of slightly more general point i, I really kind of welcome the, the the shared ambition i think uh, talking about buses has sometimes been a bit of a lonely occupation and, and for years i was looked at as being quite eccentric um, I'm really pleased that buses are much more fashionable. I was a bit mean about the um, national bus strategy early on, but I actually really do welcome the publication of it because I think it gives us a, a once in a generation opportunity to make the really significant changes that I think all of us want to see. But the element that will enable us to do that above all else, and um, Pascal nodded at it with reference to Switzerland and London, is resource and investment. 
So whilst the national bus strategy is, is a really important step in the right uh, direction, what I don't yet know is what investment it will actually unlock to enable me to build a world leading public transport system with the best possible bus service, because that's what people want. The investment so far that we've um, made as a combined authority, other than the specific investment in keeping the service running during COVID, the millions of pounds that we've invested in recent time has all been money, frankly, that we have taken from other sources. That is not money that was made available that's been given to us to invest in our bus services. It is more general economic uh, funding uh, that's been made available that we have directed towards investment in our buses because they are a very significant priority of us. So really important to use the opportunity that the, um, the National Bus Strategy provides us in terms of developing those plans at a local level. And we're working very hard to put our bus services improvement plans together and working very closely with other Metro mayors around the country. And, and I think that is a really kind of positive and constructive opportunity. But in the end, if you want to deliver a world leading bus service, which is what we do in South Yorkshire, it's got to be paid for. And while I, as Stephen from the DFT, I thought made some really sort of sensible remarks about all of this. But in the end, there's a, there's a big conversation to be had with Treasury to make sure that given the kind of the need to provide that investment, that we've got politicians at the highest level who are prepared to write those checks and make sure we can invest and underplan, underpin the plans that we want to deliver with the resources that are required to do it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Paul, can I bring you back in on that specific uh, point around tackling congestion and encouraging more people onto our buses to help with that? And of course, the greener agenda as well. Yeah, I mean, we do hear feedback that says that congestion is, is, is detrimental to, to people wanting to use the bus. Do they feel that? If there is congestion there, it's easier and more convenient to jump in a car and, and get to where they want to go to because they don't want to be sitting on a bus for a long time. And I think what Graham alluded to earlier on is that to, you know, non, a, non, a not very efficient way of, of addressing congestion is, is actually putting more buses on the roads, which, which um, uh, tries to compensate for that. So, so anti-congestion measures, we think, will be revolutionary. And, and what we've found in some experiences is, is that, um, you know, when we speak to our partners, you know, we have plans and, and sometimes for whatever reason, and I understand, you know, life is complicated, those plans not, don't necessarily eventuate. So having the, the bus services improvement plan, really sitting down, thoughtfully writing down what you're going to do, publishing that, and then holding each other's feet to the fire to deliver that, I think is a great mechanism to to, to make visible uh, and public change. So, so that's something that, that you know, that, that we would really be, uh, you know, very supportive of. And clearly, you know, we're all committed to, 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 to the green economy, the decarbonisation, and, and, and again, the, the, the uh, national bus strategy uh, and, and the zebra funding is, is something that helps us close that gap because, you know, uh, with technology just now, there is there is a, a, a difference in cost between diesel and electric and, and even bigger than hydrogen. So we've all got more work to do to, to close that gap. But, but funding is, is really helpful to, to, to get down that road. Thank you very much, Paul. And I'm going to pose, uh, it's, a, it's really taking a point from Sylvia for, from earlier. And I'm going to start with you, Graham, if, if, if that's all right. And this is around, you know, transport poverty or areas of deprivation or indeed rural areas where people just don't have the services that enable them to be able to, to, to use buses. What, what do you feel needs to be done, Graham, to, to address that? And, and Stephen, I'll come to you up to Graham on that, if I may, please. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very hard, Linda, to, to give a, a generic nationwide answer to that question. And I think that's precisely why the National Bus Strategy is asking every local transport authority to work with their operators to um, tackle uh, the issues. You know, you can see some different answers out there at the moment. So in, in Cornwall, for example, which is obviously an area which has uh, suffered as a, as a rural area in the past from decline of bus services, you've got a local authority which is visibly very behind bus services, willing to invest in them, 
uh, put on more buses, reduce fares, and they're, they're tackling it in, in that way, a, a very resource-driven way. Elsewhere in the country, you've got pilots of demand-responsive transport, for example, which are looking at whether there is a means of offering bus transport, which is both a, a, a little bit more cost effective to provide and actually more importantly, better tailored to the needs of local communities. So you, you, you've got those, you've got other um, ideas out there being tested at the moment, but I really think to find the answer to how, how do you tackle those areas of low transport provision, we're really gonna need to look to the, the BSIPs and we're really gonna need to see some answers based on local circumstances about how to, to improve things. Thank you very much. And over to you, Stephen, please. Thanks, Linda. And I think I touched on some of this before uh, when, when I was talking a little about the, the Rural Mobility Fund uh, and, and demand for the transport. Um, I think I, I entirely agree with, with, with what Dan Jarvis was saying about funding being at the heart of this. Uh, and you know, others have talked about just how much services have reduced over, over years. And a lot of that has been down to the choices and the challenges that have faced local authorities about where they're able to spend the money that, that's available to them, particularly the, the resource funding that, that, that comes from my colleagues in, in MHCLG. And so there's something definitely here about the funding position and us making the case with our colleagues in the Treasury to, to reverse that and to get the balance between service support and infrastructure in, investment right uh, as we move forward with that three billion. Uh, and I think a really important point for me, for, for anybody on this call involved in, in putting BSIPs together, is please do not hold the ambition back. Please tell us what you think the ambition should be. Please prioritise within that. So if we can't get all the money, uh, we can we can make sure we're funding the, the top things there. But actually, if we get that sense of ambition, the sense of scale of what of, of, of what people want to achieve, even if the three billion isn't enough, we begin to have an, an evidence to, uh, base for our ministers to have a conversation with their treasury colleagues and others about the scale of change that is potentially possible here and the level of ambition that's out there. And I think that applies to actually transport poverty and transport wildernesses uh, as much as it does in the city uh, or, or in another context. Uh, I, I think I just end by saying, I, I think I had a sort of moment a year or so ago where I realised I'd probably been thinking about demand responsive transport in the wrong way. I'd been thinking about it as how do you get commercially viable DRT rather than as how does demand responsive transport become potentially a solution for those transport wilderness areas that either cost the same as a traditional bus uh, or potentially even less, but actually gives a much better service and a much better opportunity to people. Thank you very much. Well, as ever, the hour has gone too quickly. Uh, so listen, thank you very much to all of the panel. Uh, I, I'll, I will summarise all of this in the main group. Uh, I have to give them two minutes feedback. But, you know, some really fantastic stuff there. And for me, really, it's the, it's, it's the ambition that is within the National Bus Strategy, but locally uh, and working together to ensure that we do deliver an ambitious improvement plan for, for people. And that's what will bring people back onto our buses. So thank you very much. There's a link to the main um, forum in, in, in the chat if anybody needs to join, but thank you all very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you everybody, great session. So that's why the audience questions will come in. And um, can you see attendee chat? If that's not showing that drop down list for you, if you go over to the top right of your screen now where those three horizontal white lines are in the top right, if you click that, and in that list there's um there's some options there. So if you make sure there's a tick next to attendee chat, you'll be able to see that as well. You can get that as well, David. Yeah, Great. Um, so that's where we will 
um, see the audience uh, talking amongst themselves, um, and that is such an open point of sensitivity. Fabulous. And um, just to say, Renata, uh, there is a kind of five minute new movie period. So if we can start the five. Christine, Crack on. Yeah. 
So, uh, have you got the link that it says present the URL? So, uh, Can I even put up my message? Just hold on, can I? Because in the end, it doesn't show it. You know, he, he was enabling that my question to be visible. I said, hold on tight. Close up to the Ta-da! Here we are. So just, Get going. Um, so just a few quick things before we kick off. 